So for our program tonight, it's what is it or what's it, as we say here in Maine. So we've got Roger and Becky Delaware and Don Taylor, who are going to be our presenters. So without further ado, I'll... We'll have Roger go first. Roger, you're up. <laughs> Foundry people. When you heat the big batch of iron up, and you don't use it all on the on the stove and covers and pieces for your stove, they had other little artifacts that they used the iron on instead of reheating it. So sometimes they built toys in some of them. I'm not saying that these were built here by Portland Stove Foundry, but they could have been built by Glendale or a half a dozen different companies. And a lot of people collect them. And if they uh, they stood the test of time. They're not plastic, and you can set them out, and they'll, they'll stand the, the gap. This one had a little bit of trouble with the ladder. Perhaps something got dropped on it. They're a little brittle, but they're, they're well made. We get another one here. This is a, probably a little later design, probably in the 30s. It's got a wind-up uh, spring in it, and they probably went on a little set of tracks to some spot at one point in time. These others were just used to play with on the floor. And we'll go from that to inert hand grenades. I think those iron, iron toys all came from Wade Harmon. Yeah, down on the Black Point Road. This is uh, what the military hands the guys to practice. That's quite heavy. And, uh, you don't just throw it like a baseball, you do, you ruin your shoulder. They teach the guys to swing and lob them, and they practice with them, and that's what it is. And uh, we have another one in there that I have uh, doubts about. It's got, a, it's got a steel ring around it that's never been broken, and a pin in it. And, I, and it's also, uh, the base of it, it looks like it still has a charge in it, and I think perhaps that I'd leave it. <laughs> it's, a, it's all right to have, it's not going to hurt anything out there, but, but we should probably have it here in society. Then we move over to, to what we get this grand old sewing machine here. I guess I'm not showing that. But uh, the powder horns, everybody had one that had a musket, and just about everybody on the farm had a musket of some sort to keep the wolf away from the door. And a lot of these horns, uh, they, uh, they had to bore them and scrape them. And a lot of guys would uh, scrape them with a broken piece of glass and work them right down until they were real thin. You could hold them up to, the, up to a light and tell if it was powder in them. They'd be so thin, some of them. A lot of people directed, uh, put uh, their initials on the horn to signify who it belonged to. Uh, you have some that are very, very collectible today. This one is, says 1786 on it. It very well could be. Uh, some of them had a, had a metal <coughs> ring in them. Some of them just uh, brought the wood out and contoured it so a piece of uh, strapping could be wrapped around it to hang, hang on your body. Uh, this one would be here. And uh, this, uh, the strap is long gone on this one. But that, that's probably uh, in the 1700s. It says it is. But, uh, there are people who go along and pick these up and uh, make them spurious. They may be a today's horn that may have an earlier date on it. And uh, unless you are really a connoisseur of that type of thing, you wouldn't be able to tell. Uh, today, there's people that uh, embellish them a lot with uh, silver and other things and, and make them quite valuable. It's not unheard of to sell for several thousand dollars. And uh, plus we know what these are. All, everybody had these, but these served a dual purpose. Uh, I don't know if <laughs> this particular pair here <coughs> would, uh, spats would uh, do much good against snakes, but a lot of times in the South they had these and they were leather. 
and they were quite thick. And they had them that uh, come up almost to the knee, and they, and they served a dual purpose. But, uh, that's what those are. I would say those are World War One. No, bands, bands in World War One. That's two. Yeah, I believe. Well, you're probably right. You'd you know. <laughs> we move over here. This is a is a, <clears throat> a bayonet. I'm not absolutely sure. If it's uh, yeah, it's World War One. It would have gone on Springfield at uh, quite an ungainly piece of goods, but it went in conjunction with the type of belts that we issued in World War Two, and they built a belt with uh, uh, brass keepers in it, so all the stuff could hang from it instead of lugging it on different types of belting and so forth. They had one belt and they had the they had all of their gear tied on to that, which was canvas. It served a dual purpose. Leather is wonderful stuff, but in the Philippines and where they were over in the Pacific, the leather's a poor choice and it was better to have the the canvas. That's this is well that's World War II in Korea. And today they're still using that same design on the grenade. Uh, canteen, rather, the grenade style. This, I thought, <clears throat> this is Japanese, and normally all the stuff that was uh, usable uh, had a chrysanthemum on top of the receiver, and that was all of the better made guns. And this one was uh, designed and built in 1911, and it was uh, it was a, uh, had a, a bayonet attached right to it instead of a separate bayonet. And uh, they didn't issue a lot of these. I, I looked it up and most of them were 6.5. And everything in World War II, they tried to use 7.7, .7, which is 31 caliber. Because their machine guns and everything were, that they had were 31 caliber, not 6.5. Uh, that probably was issued to Marines. They have a Marine Corps just like everybody else does, I guess. Uh, we get into headgear. This is uh, the outside headgear. There would have been a liner in this. This is World War II in Korea. And uh, this other fellow here that's with it is a World War I issue. And that didn't have a line on it. That had a, a, a apparatus of canvas laced into it. And in World, excuse me, in World War II, this the home guard used these. They kept this all the civil defense and everything in the country. They were issuing these. They weren't issuing the, the others, the home, the homeland. <coughs> Another powder on. This got some. A little bit of writing on it here, here the yawn. and that's probably very old too. It's uh, it's uh, we get the livestock. It's beginning to eat into it a little bit in places. Not in our museum. I can't tell what it is for livestock. <laughs> this would have been a a uh, Spanish American War era canteen. <laughs> Uh, would have been issued with a, a Craig rifle or a, or a trapdoor Springfield. That's what they would have been lugging at that period of time. Uh, this is steel, where this other canteen is aluminum. I would imagine it's uh, probably a lot easier to produce the aluminum ones and uh, less problems with uh, our natural resources. This particular firearm. I know a little bit about this because I was with my dad and mom when he acquired it. He acquired it. He didn't up. buy it. Huh? She said he didn't buy it. How'd he get it? Did he trade? We visited the lady. Yeah, <coughs> Mrs. Hayes. Beg pardon? Her name was Mrs. Hayes. Mrs. Hayes. She lived on Hessian Hill in Limerick. 
we went out and, and she, my dad asked her if she might have anything. She uh, took old a fire liking to dad. She called up a week or so later and uh, she spoke and she said she had several things he might be interested in. So we took a second trip up there and my dad acquired this. Was you born? Yes, he was. <laughs> yes, he was. Yes. He yes. certainly was. He was 16 years old. <laughs> this, uh, the other two items that he had, uh, oh, one wow. of them ended up with my cousin Howard. It was a uh, Committee of Safety musket, which was uh, built probably right up in that era uh, by some blacksmith in the area. This particular gun here, was a, a kind of a rarity, and we got reading about it in the study. It's torn and tune, it's Dutch, and Benjamin Franklin was over in Europe traveling around trying to find firearms for the revolution. And uh, he'd gone just about everywhere, and he ended up with the Dutch. The Dutch built this particular style of firearm for the Austrian army, and they had 250 of them left. And he acquired them for the revolution, for us. And what makes it uh, kind of unique is the fact that it's a rifle bore, which uh, all of our revolutionary period firearms uh, were 75 caliber, the majority of them were 69. And they, uh, they didn't have rifles, they were smooth bore. So this is kind of a unique piece. And at last I knew that we checked on it, I may stand corrected on that. They, they, uh, they brought 250 of them over, and there's only four of them can be accounted for now in the country. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean that the, there can't be another one in Virginia in somebody's upstairs attic. That not. was a bad Very one. well could be. <laughs> but uh, this was in Hessian Hill, up in uh, Limerick, and it's quite possible. Uh, I don't know why they call it Hessian Hill, other than I did, I was told by somebody, and it's just hearsay, that several Hessians stayed in this country after the revolution and migrated up there and lived there. And that's why they called it Hessian Hill. Do you have any idea what the value of that would be on the market today? Well, I, I appraise firearms, the people, the law firms. And it's something like that. It's well over ten thousand dollars. That was a bit of rust when we got that. Yeah. It, uh, the only thing you could tell that this was green, the brass on it. Everything else was uh, in pretty tough shape. But Dad was pretty careful cleaning it, not to get carried away and sand it or anything like that. He just cleaned it, and it's it's in fireable condition right now. It would be safe to shoot. Roger, could you hold it up? Because people here aren't seeing very well. Back to the old lady. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he really didn't do much to it. The only thing we never could find to go on it, and we didn't really know, was to find the find a rare site for it. So we don't have that. And the bore on it is uh, it actually when they put this gun together. They had to have a core that they heated the steel and pounded it around to create <coughs> the uh, rifling. It wasn't rifle. It was it was uh, seven uh, seven uh, lands and grooves. It's very odd. Yeah. It, uh, and it's it's so coarse. It's not something you could rifle very easily. It wasn't bored and uh, ringed. It was cast around, not cast around, pounded around. A, uh, a piece of steel, the core. Do you know what the spiral is? We, we, we shoved a, a, a rod through it with tight patches. It's a turn of 72 inches, I think. It's a real slow twist. But it's a rare rarity because at that period in time, the, there were no rifled muskets. I mean, they started rifling in, in Pennsylvania the Dutch and Swiss and so forth, the Germans, uh, for, for, my, uh, for uh, Kentucky rifles, the Pennsylvania rifle. And that was about the only thing that was rifled. But Dad made this up to show what the military has to date. That's 
That's revolution. That's a mini ball, and that would have been used in the Civil War. It was 58 caliber. Then we step into the, the Indian Wars and the early Spanish American was 4570, and Craig and both of those attend to use down in the tropical areas so they don't corrode. This, of course, is World War, early, uh, late World War I. They come off of the 3003, and that didn't take, so they went to 3006. And then uh, late after the Korean War, of course, we come into the 308, and that was used right up in, into Vietnam some. They're still using it today because it's a, it's a better arm to, for uh, eliminating people than this little pipsqueak here. Uh, of course, when we are part of NATO, NATO, everybody has to be armed the same. The same ammunition for everybody. That was a part of the idea behind NATO, that we could supply arms and ammunition to any other country. And uh, that's the way it is. <laughs> this is a, a, a carbine, 30 carbine. The guy that invented that uh, was doing time in prison for uh, running liquor down south. <laughs> and he, uh, he invented that uh, firearm, it was a semi-automatic. He invented that while he was in prison. This is uh, John M. Browning's introduction here. It was a 45 ACP, and they still use them today. Very reliable, very good handgun. Are you going to be very careful cleaning that before you put that back? <laughs> if you don't, I will. <laughs> yeah. Well, the reason it's here is uh, my father didn't want to see it sold anywhere. I don't either. I have some things that are going to come here that uh, I want to stay here. That old lady was... She thought a lot of this museum from what we told about it. Oh, yeah. We it didn't nice have lady. a museum then. The house is still there. Uh, a, she a lady can't named be alive. Camp, no. The lady named <laughs> Camp bought the house and restored it back to its original decor inside and out. It's quite a place. If you go up on Hessian Hill, it's the only really old farm on the left-hand side headed back towards Portland. It's a very beautiful old place. Uh, okay. I don't see anything else here. <laughs> Soap stones. Plus we don't know what those are. That's mine. That's mine. That's mine. That's mine. All right. <laughs> 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 Can you pass around the... Uh, Don's going to give us a talk about research. Hi everyone. Hi. Hi. I'm um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Don Taylor. Uh, I really enjoy doing research, and I enjoy doing genealogy research in particular. So I'm kind of like the go-to person from a lot of these folks in order to to handle that. And one of the things that I found about the museum, the historical society, is we have an incredible amount of materials available for research. There are things here that you just can't hardly find anywhere else. Uh, one of the first things that you'll have noticed when you come into the museum is on the right hand side there's a bookcase. And everybody's seen that bookcase, right? Tons of books. One of the books is produced by the Maine Genealogical Society, but it's a great one. It's the Vital Records of Scarborough, Maine. And it's indexed and it will tell you just how many uh, uh, children were, I just opened any page, of uh, Rich I. Libby and Elizabeth, his wife, who were born in 1820. That's like halfway through the book. So if you're doing research on Libby's or anybody else who ever lived in Scarborough, this is a great resource. Along with it, there are places where it will show you, every, there are other books that will show you every person uh, in the 1790 census and where they lived and what they were doing and that sort of thing. There's a whole series of books on that. Um, there are books on York County. Everybody knows that this was once York County, right? <laughs> Before it was a state, for sure. But it certainly was a part of it. Well, there's a whole set of York County deed books that you can follow people back into the 1700s and where they lived and what they were doing. 
And that's all in that one bookcase. It's an amazing amount of material there. One of the other things that we have, um, and it's a place that I do a lot of my particular research with, is what we call the, um, uh, the, the, the fire, safe, um, fire safe file cabinets. There's 12 of them that contain information on just about everything that you can imagine here in Scarborough. I knew they have been being put together, these folders and files, for 50 years, I suppose. And uh, it has church records and cemetery records and business records and just all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. There's even material there from uh, one of the authors who uh, put their research notes into it about the Libby family and Scarborough today and, and that stuff. So it's, it's, it's just amazing. Well, on top of all these records, oh, hold on. Uh, there's a book. It's just a little folder, but you wouldn't know just from this, that it contains the folders and the names of them and locations for virtually everything in those, in those uh, file cabinets. A great finding aid. Just an amazing amount of material there. One of the other sections of files, and there are four of those drawers that, in the, that contain files, and they're like this, uh, of families, family information, tons of stuff about them. I just grabbed one here on the plumbers. And there are handwritten notes and materials. There are uh, working card for F. Plumber. I think that's one of your ancestors. Could have been. Could have been. <laughs> no, you have plumbers in your family. There's some buttons here which are people I'm researching. Uh, but all kinds of stuff. So if you ever need to do any kind of research, Ask, and somebody will help get you to the correct files. And that's like great reference and resource, I believe. One of the other things that's here is, and they're in several locations, but as a good example of it, there are the cemeteries of Scarborough. This is an amazing set of materials because it really takes you through every cemetery in Scarborough and provides linkages and photos and information about everybody who was buried here. We also have a huge <coughs> section of material uh, that's being been put together over the years for obituaries. There are obituaries from, from the last 50 years and, and a lot longer than that. So it's just an amazing amount of material. If you need to do any kind of research for family, just, uh, for genealogy, for family history, it's a great reference. As I said, this will show you pictures of cemeteries and markers and just all kinds of things, right, within this one much of book. So just an amazing set of resources. Started hidden away in the back room where people don't see them so often. And that's one of the things that I, as a researcher, love to know is what's hidden away in the back room. Because those are usually the really interesting things for a person like me. Well, one of those things that's in the back room are this uh, whole set of these file boxes they have information on, as this one does, uh, town celebration, transportation, and military. But there are ones on schools, and there are ones on locations, like pictures of Pine Point, and things like that. So this is that kind of information. It's, it's uh, kept away safe, but it still is accessible, uh, and can be used for any kind of research that you're doing, any kind of writing you're doing. If you want to write a story about something, you may well find a re reference here. The last thing I'll sort of mention is, uh, besides all the things that you can see here, and we have an amazing amount of stuff. I, I, I just love this museum and wander it a lot. We have a lot of things that you don't see in file cabinets, behind cabinets that you might not open up as you come through. Uh, but we also have a whole lot of stuff that is electronic. And we're getting more and more into doing some more and more electronic things. But one of the most amazing pieces of um, material that I've encountered uh, is something that has been put together by Bill over the past 30 years or something, at least 25 years, uh, where he has taken information about people of Scarborough and put them into a database that he's created. And he has entered 
and I think he's done most all of them, uh, nearly three quarters of a million people's entries. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly well over a hundred, or certainly over half a million. I think you're getting close to three quarters, aren't you? Yeah. Huh? Close enough. That's all right. <laughs> um, I use it a lot, uh, and it is available for uh, folks here to be able to access and, and get it. We have copies of it in a couple of places. And, you know, we, we what, what we need to do is uh, comment on the fact that many of our members have gone through various books uh -huh. and listed for that index all the people's names in the book. Yep. One of the most exciting was Dorothy Libby's mm -hmm. uh, book. We had three people working on it because he had, she had a very interesting way of writing too. <laughs> yeah. She wrote things as she saw them, not as they were. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, yeah. Certainly, you know, people have given that information over the years and, and, and stuff, but it is an awesome resource. Uh, virtually all the books in that bookcase have entries for the individuals, so you don't have to go through every book in order to see which book somebody is in. You can go to the database that he's corrected or collected. And, and developed and see a person's name and have the, that tell you the places in which books that that person might be. And the page numbers. And the page numbers. So it's an amazing set of information and for a research person like me or anybody else that's doing genealogy, <coughs> it's just like a finding aid beyond anybody's belief that you would have a finding aid <coughs> for because it is like a top level. <coughs> Uh, it's, it's large. Here's an example of just the bees, page after page after page of people, uh, and what book they're in, and uh, some other basic information about what it can find. Uh, certainly, I find the museum amazing. It has a focus in for researchers on Scarborough, but it also has a lot of materials on nearby towns and, and things around here. There are some things about Saco and Wells and you know other places not too far away. There's some a lot of research available about <coughs> Maine. Uh, there's some very old and interesting books about Maine here. Uh, we have materials here that are just one of a kind and amazing and I'm very proud to be a part of, of of this group and I'm very proud to uh, uh, be able to utilize some of these materials and I uh, hope all of you enjoy your time with the museum and its capabilities because it's awesome. <laughs> and now it's her turn. <laughs> you just have to remember that when you need to solve something, that's where you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> Well, originally I was going to be the only person that did this, but as more I talked about it, it became contagious, and other people wanted to talk about things too. Um, the things that we have up here are all a part of our collection. Um, yesterday we had volunteers go around and pick out things that um, either they didn't know what they were, or they thought they'd be interesting for other people to know what they were. So I was. I said I do the talking because we have a lot of shy people here. Um, so, first I'm going to tell you some definitions of some museum terms. Artifact is anything in the museum. It can be three-dimensional, it can be written, it can be a book. Um, some museums say they're just three-dimensional things, but other museums say it's anything in your collection, so it's all-inclusive. Um, a manuscript is anything that's handwritten. Manu, hand, script, written. A document is anything that is printed or written. That's not bound in a book or a magazine. So it's like loose pages that, that people have written. Um, and the other word that I want you to know is ephemera. Ephemera is stuff 
that was made for a one-time use, a napkin. Many people, you use a napkin, you throw it away. If it has anniversary or marriage information on it, many people keep it. It's ephemera. They've kept it. It was made to be a one-time use, but people kept it. Um, anything like that, a calendar, um, anything that was made for one-time use. So you may hear me use those terms, and I just want you to know what I'm saying. So, the things are up here that they <coughs> chose. This is kind of a what's it. You know, do you know what it is? And if so, have you used one? Anybody know what this is? It's a soapstone. It's a foot warmer. Okay. Yeah. It's big enough so you can put your feet on it. So that if it's warm, you can sit in church. Churches weren't heated. So, or in a sleigh. Keep your feet warm. And if your feet are warm, you're That's right. Now, this is not a footstone. Well, mm -hmm. it, it is. It is a footstone. <laughs> Do you know what it is? How it's different from this one? It doesn't have a handle. It doesn't have a handle. It came from a cemetery. It yeah. came from a cemetery. It was at the foot of the grave. It was at the foot of the grave, <laughs> right. And it has the initials MLCV on this one. Usually it's just the initials. Usually there isn't a name on it, just the initials. And um, I didn't look up the time period, but there was only a certain time period that they did headstones and footstones. And the footstone was literally put at the foot of the person that was in the grave. Um, there is a cemetery up on Arbor Lane that Judge Hasty is buried there. And he was a tall man, so the headstone's here and the footstone's here. His wife was a shot woman. Her headstone's here, her footstone's here. Um, so it's very clear that it was placed at her feet. Hand knit cotton stockings. And they would come up quite a ways. <laughs> Do they use a garter belt with that to hold them up? You know, I had that question when I was thinking about it today. So I wonder if they had a garter belt. But it has got that cuff like you would have on a shot her sock. So. Mm -hmm. And I believe these came from the Larrabee place at Noscaro. Now I had to show you those first so I could show you these next. Mm -hmm. Anybody know what they are? Stocking? Stretches. Stretches. Yes. They were cotton. Your socks were cotton. You washed and they shrunk. You put them on a stretcher and they'd stay the same size and shape. These were children's. Children's stockings. It's a child. I bet a lot of people have used these. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Not in a while. Toast up. <laughs> right? Not that kind. You put the bread in, you toast one side, you open it up, you turn it over and put it in. If you fell asleep while you were toasting, one side would be burnt and the other one wouldn't. <laughs> what provided the heat? Um, I believe this was electric. Yeah, yeah. I don't see the plug. Yes, the plug right there. Yeah. This, Same thing. <laughs> good for you, I thought it was a popcorn popper, <laughs> because we had one given to us and I thought it looked like this, but you're right, it's a toaster, it's a toaster for, somebody told me, a campfire, because it has the holes, so you can put it on a fire, you just lay your bread on either side, you toast it, flip it over, toast the other side. So if you took you're a round burner off your wood stove. Yep. And you just had embers in the bottom, coals in the bottom, that would fit right over where yep. those round covers came mm -hmm. up. So you could use that on a cook stove. Yep. You probably could use it on a, a, an oil stove, too. Right. There you go, Mom. You like to use that at your house. Mm -hmm. You could use that at your house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
It's a rush lamp. There was a rush, you know, like a cattail, but a rush from the marsh. It would stick down in there. There's a little hole down there that you'd stick the stem in. And the rush would be kind of fluffy with seeds. And you'd light it, and that would be your light. That's for rich people that did the, for poor people that couldn't afford wax candles. It must have been a slow burning type of weed or something. I would guess, yeah. <clears throat> I spent all the house for this. Now I looked this one up because I thought I knew what it was. And it says it's something else from what I thought it was. But I still think I'm right. <laughs> It says in our book that it's a colander, and this is a pestle. Well, I can agree, this is a pestle, and it's sort of a colander. But I think it's more of a ricer, or a strainer, that you put your potato, or apple sauce, or squash, and then you just force it around. Can I weigh in on that one? Sure. So those are, <clears throat> that is commonly called a china cap, which probably isn't politically correct. But those are the basis of every good cream soup. So when you make your stock, and you've got your onion and your tomatoes and everything that's been simmering, you put it in that. This is before food processes. And you, so you dump that, you put a pot underneath here. Yep. And then you take that thing and you just go round, 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 round until you have nothing left except a little bit of roughage which goes out. But that, so if you make cream of mushroom soup, cream of tomato, cream of broccoli soup, this was what you used. So you wouldn't agree with the book that it says it's a colander? It's a china cap. Yeah. Okay. And I think yeah, we're it's a colander. No, it's a colander of sorts. And I, I still I have one of those. I use it all the time. <laughs> we call it a chinoise. A what? Chinoise. It's a French term. The French use it. It was called a chinoise. Now this one was just brought out tonight. And I think I know what it is, but I'm going to show you how we look it up. We have, can you hold it and tell me the number? Everything is marked with an accession number. This is our file cabinet, one of them. That if we look it up by accession number, it will tell us what it is and where it came from. So it's a 76, so I'm going to look on the 76. Dot one eight. Dot eighteen. Dot three. Dot three. Now, this is how some of our people who are historians weren't sure what it was, so they labeled it what they thought it was. It is a rock. <laughs> <laughs> around it. Probably an Indian tool, this, and it was located in the second room. And it was given by Alice Rollins. Now, we have another way to look them up. We have notebooks. But you hold on to it, because I'm going to look it up in the notebook and see if it says anything else. We have notebooks. And these, by a session number, will tell us what was said in the notebook. So we want 1976, because the 76 indicates it was 1976. And here is the one for 1976. If I turn it right side up, it's much better reading. Well, I saw that it is. Turn it over three more times, and maybe I'll have it the right side. So 76. 18, 3, says the same thing, so there was no additional information. But I am quite sure it was some kind of an Indian tool, because it is shaped, it's shaped to have something tied around it. You can see, there's a ring there where, where it was worn in. Sledgehammer? Could be a sledgehammer, could be a hammer, could be a plummet. It could be a club. It 
could have been anything like that. So. <laughs> know what it is? Pencil box. Pencil box. Anybody ever use one like this? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this one has a groove in the end, then it has grooves in this part, it has a place underneath, and then this part that slides has the Kings of England on it. <coughs> And this has a place for notes, so you could write notes, so and then it was decorated on the top. What's the most recent of the uh, monarchs of England in that? Yeah, Edward the Seventh in 1901. Okay. It kind of dates it, doesn't it? Ta ta the first one is William the Conqueror in 1066. Kings and queens of England, and that's. Oh, I have a new pencil for when you start. That's right, you did. Mine were a little different than that. These are tax records of the town of Scarborough, um, starting in the year July 10th, 1847. These were brought to us by a lady in Wyndham who located them on the town dump. Somebody from Scarborough probably had a parent who was connected with Scarborough. They moved to Wyndham when the parent got old and moved in with a child. When the ch father, mother, parent died, a bunch of junk in the attic that came with mom and dad, and it went to the dump. We have two of them. Buttons? Yes, Spanish American. Um, I was doing research to do a display in Spanish American. I thought we're not going to have anything Spanish American in Scarborough. I mean, it was a war that lasted what nine months, seven months, something sure. like that. So you know, nobody from Scarborough would have got involved in it. Well, I was surprised to say we've got buttons, we've got awards. Um, I don't know if these came from him. It says on the back was worn on the arm of one of the main boys that was at, at Cuba through the Spanish-American War. But, drawing a blank of his first name, Judy Roy's father. Joe. Joe. They were Joe's medals that we have. Roy. Now, I don't know if I can lift this up. Yeah, I guess I can. It's a stereoptican. Which is the forerunner of a view master for people who don't know stereoptican. Um, this was a table stereoptican. We have some upstairs that were handheld, but this was a table stereoptican. And this slides so that you can make it whatever. Now this is a sad story. Um, this is an object that was brought to us and unfortunately we have members who are friends, they want to help contribute, but they bring things in and they leave them on the table with no note, no idea of who brought it or what it was or why they gave it to us. And this is one of those objects. It never got a session because we don't know who brought it or what it's supposed to be. It's painted on, whether the hole was there originally or if it was drilled for the painting. The back side is tapered on the very end. But we don't know. So if you give something to us, please leave us a note and tell us who gave it, when you gave it, and what it is, so we can contact you and say, um, we know you gave something, but we're not sure what it is. Can you tell us about it? And 
and I don't want to keep going on, but I will do a few more things, and when you get tired of me talking, just give me the signal and I'll shut up. A bottle of Kappa. People made their own root beer, whatever else, whatever it's and this would cap the bottle and keep it under pressure. Good to make sure that it was all done working before you cap it. Yeah, because they exploded. Ice skates. Anybody ever use this style? Close though. And it was a fairly large foot, I would say. And they were adjustable, so you could make them bigger or small. There's a hole in this oh, yeah. upright part. There's a grater. Not made greater. Oh. Now Joyce was really fascinated with this one. Oh. Pancake turner. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Phone. Telephone receiver. Oh. Oops, I'm holding it. Yeah, I'm holding it the wrong way. I guess this would be the side that you do the ear, and this is the part that you talk to. Did Bell remove that one? Oh, let's see. Did Bell do this one? Oh, the thing could have been a on it. I can't see with my glasses on it. I don't see a name on it. Oh, yes, right here. The Connecticut Telephone and Electric Company, Meridian, Connecticut. Huh? <laughs> now they fooled me with this one. It's got a groove here. It's got a point down here. Cheese eye. Because if we're turning on a water thing, it will turn. You know? It's a cabbage cora. Oh, Well, apparently there was a big cabbage industry here in Starbrook because reading some... Pardon? Whatever you wanted to do with the cabbages, I guess. Um, I read in some of the papers here at one point that there were train loads of cabbages going south from Scarborough. Yeah. <coughs> In the post watch newspaper articles from the early 20th century, they were constantly naming a farmer and how many loads of cabbages he was shipping out. That was the big crop. Going to Boston, yeah. all the Irish that wanted their corned beef and cabbage. <laughs> So what is it? Not a popcorn pot. This is a bed warm. And you would put the coals in it and you'd run it between the sheets to warm the sheets up before you crawled in. Now this is another thing. It came in and it sat around here for a while and it never got an accession number on it. But I think I know what it is. This was the official measure of the sealer of weights and measures. Herbie Wentworth was a sealer of weights and measures in Scott, well, in southern Maine, I guess, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And this was, I believe, his, that he would take and take to wherever 
he went, and if, I don't know how much this is supposed to hold, but if the measure was the same as this, you were getting an honest measure. If it was different, you needed to change your apparatus so that it did measure like this. It's a laundry plunger to wash your clothes. You'd have a tub, and I assume this would agitate somewhat, and you'd wash your clothes. <laughs> I've used one of these, so hopefully most of you know what it is. Mop handle. The old grab mop would go in there, you tighten it up, and then you put your right mop and wash your floor. <laughs> now this one, I can't lift up because it's heavy. Well, maybe I can lift up. Rod, you be still. <laughs> Anybody else know what it is? <laughs> it is. It's a fire horn for... Black Point Fire Station. Oh. Huh. So when you heard eight sounds, what was happening? The rescue call. It was a rescue call. We want to be near the end of it when we're all. No. Mm -hmm. Close. Baby carriage. <laughs> <laughs> it was a harness for goats. Oh. 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 You'd hit your cat on there. And this was the harness that you put around the goat. And I had a postcard at home showing a little girl riding in a wagon behind a goat in a goat harness like this. And I couldn't locate it tonight to show you. But. Becky, do we know where it came from? We can find out. A goat house. 94581. Everybody remember that. 9854. 9854. What is it? 94. Now somebody's saying 94 and somebody's saying 94. 94. <laughs> it came from A. E. Baisley and Iva Johnson. So Baisleys were not Scarborough. Some of you that not Scarborough. Okay. What else do we have here? It's a plane. You know what kind of plane? It's called a Howell plane. And it was used to make barrels. You know, you have the lid of the barrel and then you have the rim above it. This trimmed the rim above the barrel top. It's called a Howell plane, or a compass plane. I can tell you what it is, but I can't tell you how it worked. It's painful. It says a paper punch. So I don't, yeah. I'm not sure how it would work as a paper punch, but we would make very big holes. Actually, a lot of them. Yeah, you're more right. 
last. A shoe last. And if you notice, there isn't really much place for a toe because they were made um, so you could wear either shoe on either foot. So until you got them broken in so that you had your toe, you had a left and right, they were universal. <laughs> Okay. This one I have no idea why we have it, but anybody have a guess? It looks like a paddle. It does. A weaving. And that's what I thought it was, was a paddle. I think it's a weaving. I agree. The big, the big one. And the ceiling fan. Our a session record say it's a ceremonial sword. That's why I don't know why we have it because. Yeah, who's ceremony? Anything else? Oh, there's tablet here that I don't know what they are. Everybody should know what that is. That's right. It's a bog shoe. It would go on the animal's foot, mm -hmm. so it acted like, a, well, what I say to kids, it was a snowshoe for the marsh, so you wouldn't sink into the marsh. It could be an ox or a horse. Now we have a couple of more things. If you have the patience, I have to look them up because I don't know what they are. You want to go for it? What is it? That's for taking a pie out of the oven. I brought that in here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? That thing slides. slides. This slides back and forth, but yeah, supposedly you can reach in a hot oven and pull pie out of that. Oh, okay. said lead made me think about they used to have oakum and you pack a lead yeah. like a drain. Oh, you have to pack that. This is a masonry spaghetti <laughs> jointer. <laughs> Can anybody explain to me what that means? What was it? Masonry spaghetti jointer. When you joint between two bricks after they're laid up. I don't know what spaghetti is. Just that it's curved. Just that it's curved. So your hand would be, and then you you pack the water down. Yeah, you yeah. you draw it out to smooth out the yeah. drain. Okay. Make Jimmy Carrington's. No, I think I've done everything up here. <laughs> so do you want the? Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. I did. I did want to do this on your the um, table over here. We have a trolley. Um, model. model that was made by Foster Levitt. He was a man from Saco and he died this year or last year? This past year. This past year. He made the models. He made everything in it. He then encased it in a display um, case and brought it and gave it to us. There are six or eight of them that he has made and given to us. The York, York Museum has several lots, so. so I just thought everybody gives to us, and we, we are very pleased that people think of us and give to us. Um, the only thing is we'd like to know what it is and who's giving it. Um, things come from everywhere. The dump. <laughs> Um, addicts, um, we've said to a number of people, if you're cleaning out grandma's attic and you're the one that's been designated to do it, don't get a dumpster. <laughs> load it in, if there's papers and things like that, load them in cardboard boxes and bring them to us. 
and we'll go through and throw out what what's not needed. It's not. I mean, we don't need grocery lists, but you never know when you're going to come across tax records. Um, Twenty years ago, was it? We got a call from the Boston Museum, um, Boston Archives in Massachusetts. They had come. They were going through their old records. They'd come across some Scarborough, Maine records. We went down, I don't know how many file cases like this there were. There were maybe five. We came home with a lot. Um, what we had, they would not give them to us. They were theirs. And they would not give but them to us. But we had to use. But they photocopied them for us and sent us the photocopies. And what was there was school records, school agent records, select men records. What period is it? Um, 1800s, I believe, um, and what had happened was the man who lives in Scarborough got sick, couldn't live by himself, moved to Boston with his son or daughter. When he passed away, they didn't know what to do with the stuff, but they didn't throw it away. They gave it to the Boston Museum, so it was preserved and with this good will of the Boston Museum, they let us know um, that they had them. And in the 1800s, if you held the selectman's office, when you got through, you took your records with you. There was no place to store them. So all of this man's, he had been school agent, he'd been selectman, he'd been county sheriff. I don't know what else he'd been, but all his records from each one of those offices were in Boston. So, when you clean it out, let us know. Don't throw. <laughs> Thank you. That's the presentation for tonight.